Hello, hello, and uh, thank you for joining me for another virtual tour of some of the uh, rooms at Winneter. My name is James Kelleher. I'm an architectural historian, and more to the point for today, I'm a recent graduate of the Winneter program in American Material Culture, class of 2020. Uh, where I focus primarily uh, in my studies on early architecture of New England. Now, related directly to that, uh, today I'm going to show off a couple of my uh, favorite rooms in the Winneter House, those being the Heart Room and the Oyster Bay Room. Now, both of those have the distinction of being some of the earliest rooms uh, in the house that Henry Francis DuPont collected. So we're actually going to start where I'm standing now in the Heart Room. This room was built in 1680, and it is notable in that it's one of the only rooms in Winneter, or one of a small handful of rooms, that we can def uh, date very definitively. And that's because in the past uh, 10 or 15 years, there was dendrochronological testing done on the frame of this house. Now that's a, obviously a mouthful, but it basically refers to tree ring dating. If you take samples of some of the beams in this room, or, or in any timber frame house or structure, you can actually look at the tree rings in a sequence from those timbers and cross-reference them with a known uh, chronology of how trees grow over time. And basically, by matching those together, you can get a really precise date uh, for a house. And doing that with this house, uh, and I believe this specific room, uh, we arrived at a date of, or researchers, certainly not me, arrived at a date of 1680, uh, which makes this, I think, handily the single oldest room on the Winterthur property. Uh, this room was collected in, I believe, 1938 from a house in Ipswich, Massachusetts, built by Samuel Hart. Now, Ipswich is located in the northeastern part of Massachusetts, an area that has a, an unusually high concentration of very early houses, uh, what historians call first period architecture. And that refers to the area of about 1625 to 1725, plus or minus a couple years on either end of that. So as I mentioned, this room was from a house built for Samuel Hart in 1680. Now, this room itself is one of two rooms that were in the original house. It was built with one room on top of one room with a fireplace, uh, a chimney stack off to one side, still very much within the house. It's not like you'd see in the Chesapeake, uh, but off to one side. Uh, more or less has its position here. Now this was a, a really common and a really popular way to build a house in early New England, one room on top of one room. The most common type of house, uh, probably the type that the vast majority of people lived in, was a single room house. This is just a more spacious improvement of that same basic plan. So this upstairs room would have been a little more private uh, a little less refined in its ornamentation, uh, because of course you're going to put your nicest things where people are most likely to see them. And in 1680, that's going to be your ground floor room, which in this house was almost certainly called the hall. Uh, and actually behind me, we have a great example of uh, a type of uh, piece or a type of furniture that you might see in a relatively genteel house of this period. This beautiful chest of drawers here, which was made in 1678 as helpfully dated on the top drawer, <clears throat> just about the same time that this house was built. Uh, it was also made in Ipswich or perhaps nearby Newbury, uh, Massachusetts. But either way, this is likely the type of furniture you'd see on the ground floor of the Hart House or a similar house. It's exuberant, it's painted, it is really elaborately carved for the era in which it was made. It's something you'd really want to show off. So in the same realm of, of ornament and putting your best decorative foot forward, um, you've almost certainly noticed that this room and, and really most rooms like it of the same era are not as, as richly ornamented as rooms you'd see even 
30 years later, there's none of that great paneling. There's not much of a mantle to speak of. Um, one of the most important transitions between basically a 17th century and a later style uh, is the way that ornament is applied and used in the house. And an exceptional example of that is this, what is called crease molded or shadow molded paneling here uh, on the fireplace wall. Now, as a matter of fact, this paneling is not originally from the Hart House. It's from a house down the street, also in Ipswich, uh, but it's probably contemporary with the house. So right around that 1680-ish date. Um, you can see how why it's called shadow molding. It looks excellent in these sort of low light scenarios where the light's raking across, creating this beautiful pattern of light and shadow in these, in these vertical stripes. Uh, and molding, of course, is always more about shadow than it is shape, and that's especially true uh, for this type of molding. It's also interesting to see this carved board up here. <clears throat> in 1680, classicism, what we think of classical architecture, that, that wave had not particularly broken on American shores yet, but people are starting to be aware of it, both craftspeople and presumably their clients as well. These little rectangles you see here, well, you see those 30 to 40 years later in the form of dentals or denticulation in these elaborate carved cornices of classically inspired houses the little rectangles that you see below the main molding. You see it on the exterior of houses and on the interiors as well. Now this is not as uh, uh, rigidly classical, not necessarily as refined as that, but people are starting to be aware of these basic decorative principles that would ultimately dominate the 18th and much of the 19th century. So moving out of the heart room, which is through that door, we're now in the what's called the Oyster Bay room. And you can see a lot of the same basic architectural characteristics are coming into play. We've got this long, broad summer beam, and that's this beam in the middle here, supporting these smaller beams, which are called joists. Those, in turn, support the floor above. This is classic early English construction. Now this house, we don't have a precise date for it, unlike the Hart House, but it's, it's probably late 17th, early 18th century. Um, as I mentioned earlier, styles don't change like that in any specific year, so it can be a little bit of a challenge to date uh, early, early houses, but almost assuredly this is uh, a late 17th or early 18th century house. Uh, this room was from a house uh, built for Job Wright, who lived in Oyster Bay on Long Island, uh, which at the time was a, a relatively small village. Uh, and this was one room of a two-room house, similar to the Hart House, except in this case, there was one room on either side of a central chimney. Now, that central chimney had a fireplace in each room, and the way that house was organized, which is a very common floor plan in New England and Long Island as well, it's a hall and parlor floor plan. What that basically means is you'd have one room that's the hall, which also serves as a kitchen and a general purpose gathering room. On the other side of that chimney, you'd have a parlor, which is your nicer room. This is where you'd bring guests, esteemed guests, uh, or where you would have things like the best bed or your exceptionally nice pieces of furniture or your silver, if you had silver, and your pewter, if you didn't. Now, whether this space was the hall or the parlor of the Job Wright house, I cannot say for sure, uh, but it was uh, almost certainly one of the two. Uh, that same basic floor plan can be one story, it can be two or three stories, and, and anywhere in between. As I mentioned, the Job Wright house was one story with a very high attic. One of the most remarkable pieces of this room, or shall we say, in this room, is this mantle right here. Now, this is not actually from the same house as the rest of the architecture in this room. Uh, that's from Oyster Bay. This is from Milford, Connecticut. And it is one of the only examples of a carved mantle uh, from early New England. And again, with a close-up view here, you can see more hallmarks of early ornamentation, this shallow molding 
uh, in this case, and unusually coupled with this uh, sort of diamond carving in the middle. It, it represents uh, an unusual level of, of expense, uh, of time, which is of course related to expense. It's true in the 17th century, and it remains true down to the present day. Any house that has multiple rooms has as well a hierarchy of space within and between those rooms. Architectural ornament such as this is one of the easiest ways to mark that hierarchy, not only for visitors and guests, but for occupants of the house itself. So this has been just a small taste of what, as I mentioned, are two of my favorite rooms in the entire house. Uh, people often perceive these very early spaces as primitive or simple, but in fact, they contain a huge amount of information about the ideals and the lifestyles of early colonists. So thank you so much for joining us.